I'm Douglas Rushkoff and I'm on Team Human. Playing for Team Human today, designer, activist, academic, and author of Low Tech Radical Design by Radical Indigenism, Julia Watson. But before we bring her out, I thought I'd share a little something with you about the Team Human project. Team Human began, gosh, years ago when I was on a panel with a pretty famous tech bro, a guy who believes that technology will quickly outpace human beings on the uh, evolutionary ladder. Uh, you know, he believes in both the exponential growth of the market and exponential growth of technology which means that human systems may collapse, but technology and robots and AIs can continue on without us. And his main argument was that human beings should gracefully pass the evolutionary torch to our technological successors. And I argued against that. I said, no, human beings are weird and wonderful and we can embrace paradox and hold multiple ideas in our heads at the same time. We don't need to resolve everything to a one or a zero. You know, we can watch weird movies and, and not understand them and still experience them as pleasurable. And I, I kind of made a heartfelt plea that we create a place for human beings in the digital future rather than just uh, gracefully accepting our extinction. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're only saying that because you're human, right? Like it was hubris. And that's when I said, fine, guilty. I'm on team human. And the more I talked about team human and the idea that being human is not uh, uh, some individual battle for survival of the fittest, but, but a, a collaboration, uh, the more evidence I started to find in all corners that evolution is not a competition at all, but a, a, uh, a an advancement of different ways of collaborating, uh, the development of different forms and more advanced forms of symbiosis, either uh, with other humans or with other species. And when you look at, at nature, you see so many examples that, uh, of things that were taught are competition, but are actually collaboration. In school, I was taught that trees compete to reach the sunlight. But when I actually read about trees, I find out that the taller ones that are reaching the sun end up sharing their nutrients with the smaller trees through the soil, which is not just dirt, but is a living matrix of mycelia that take a service fee for passing the nutrients back and forth. And I actually read Darwin and find out, oh my gosh, he's not talking about competition. He's marveling at the way that different species can collaborate and cooperate with one another. So really what I wanted to find out and part of what my whole team journey, team human journey has been about was to find out, you know, where was it that we got that we got off track. And you know, you could point to a lot of different moments in history from the beginning of agriculture or the beginning of sedentary living, but where things really seemed to kick into place was really the late Middle Ages and the, the beginnings of industrialism, that we started to look at progress really through the lens of capitalism and, and colonialism as some kind of competition of these different nation states to extract more resources in less time from all of their colonies. So we came to understand progress as a form of colonization. Which territory are you getting and racing to get more of them? And we ended up kind of adopting a, a unidirectional arrow for looking at time and progress and the future, that what you need to do over time is accumulate power, accumulate stuff and grow exponentially, colonize land, colonize people. And now that we're in a digital media environment, it's just uh, all the more apparent because now we're not just colonizing brown people in other places, we're colonizing ourselves. We're colonizing human time and, and human attention. But what's making me hopeful is that digital might actually be different. That in a digital age, we end up with something called cybernetics. Cybernetics is really a form of feedback. Everything you do comes back to you. You start feeling and recognizing the, the impact 
of our activities. The, the lines, these unidirectional lines become circles again. Karma begins expressing itself and we long for a way out. You know, uh, uh, in, the, in the Elon Musk way, we long for a way out of all this karma by building rocket ships and getting off the planet or we long for a way back to the garden, maybe, maybe uh, go to Burning Man or take a lot of ayahuasca and find your way back to some lost history. But I think the real path, the, the path that I'm advocating on Team Human is to retrieve the systems and ideas we left behind, the things that we left for dead when they were actually the most living, circular and advanced mechanisms for human and interspecies flourishing that really have ever been devised. So Team Human, I mean us as Team Human, is not characterized by our ability to dominate nature. You know, Team Human is really characterized by our ability to steward nature, to move back into a symbiotic call and response interaction with the living environment in which we're all a part. You know, this is not primitive, not at all but highly advanced, especially compared with the, the tractor and cement one size fits all simplicity of industrial capitalism. It's time to retrieve the genuinely complex approaches of our ancestors before we oversimplify our world beyond the capacity to sustain life itself. That's what it means to be on Team Human. And that's why we're speaking today with the designer, activist, academic, and author of a book called Low Tech Design by Radical Indigenism, a beautiful volume and journey of discovery, really, bringing these wonders of engineering by indigenous peoples who are practicing a form of engineering foreign to most of us in the West, because instead of killing and burning things for it to work, it collaborates with living systems in a practice of mutual flourishing. It's my pleasure to welcome Julia Watson. Thank you so hey. much, Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for 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 being here. Uh, I mean, I'm I. Obviously, most of what I was talking about was inspired by uh, reading your your latest book. It's a, uh, gosh, it's such a trip to go through it page by page by page as a reader. I mean, because I've had intuitions of these things, you know, you see movies about Stonehenge and go, oh, well, you know, people from a long time ago knew sorts of all this weird stuff. But to see it not as old rocks, but as living systems that that are sustaining people and and yeah. ecosystems to this day, it's a uh, more powerful than any psychedelic trip I've had actually was, was <laughs> reading your book. So, so thank you for that. Um, I thought maybe for people to get some orientation into what it is I'm even referring to here, maybe you could share a little bit about um, your journey. In other words, what was your sort of first exposure to indigenous technologies and how did you begin to pursue this whole uh, line of inquiry? Sure. Um, I began this whole journey when I was second year architecture student. And one of these courses that I took in second year architecture was a seminar course. And it was a compulsory course. Every student had to take it. And I think that was really phenomenal at the time. I think it was something that was far beyond its years and its thinking. And so this course really exposed this idea of what different Indigenous communities around Australia were doing in terms of their built environment, their infrastructures, the organization of their communities, and this looking into this whole idea of Indigenous technologies. And that really changed the way I saw architecture and the built environment. And I think it really projected me on a course to look at how we can live symbiotically with our nature and, and with our built environment in a way that I didn't see in the places I was living or the workplaces I was in or the cities I was really connecting with so much. And then what did you see first? Did you just like take a boat and start going to places? I mean, how did you, how did you start to experience these places you know, for real and live? Yeah, I, so after I finished 
studying architecture, I studied landscape architecture, and I got really interested in this community in Borneo, which are called the Penan people. And they are forest dwelling people. They were having a lot of issues with the government and they were you know, trying to stand up for their territories. They were being displaced from their territories in the forest by palm oil plantations and by you know, try, people who were trying to deforest their indigenous territory. And there was one particular environmentalist that was writing about this community. His name was Bruno Manser. He was a Swiss guy. And I started following his work, got really interested in his work. Um, about a year after I was following it, he went missing. He was walking through the jungle and disappeared. And it's still thought that he was killed by mercenaries but that were from the Malaysian government because of his work that he was doing this with this particular tribe. And I just wanted to go to Borneo. Um, so I was, you know, 22. I was on my way to London, as all Australians were at that time, after graduating from university, and I decided I would go through Borneo for a month before going to London to, to look at this landscape, to sort of see what had been going on there, to look at this heart of Borneo, it's called, this incredible diptera cup forest. And that's where it all began. I found this community of the Penan people that are living in pretty terrible conditions in a government encampment that they had been forced to live in on the side of the river and spent a day with this community and just had this moment where you know I became really interested in like why why is this happening and I spent a lot of time um, since then traveling around the world and looking at um, different spaces and and different ways that cultures had um, started to connect with different indigenous uh, landscapes. And so that's kind of where all of that began. And then maybe I guess we should share some of these examples. I know it's, it's hard to get them without actually reading the book and looking at the pictures and all, but I mean, some of them are just so uh, profound. Like if you could describe maybe that, that watershed reconstruction in Bali is- Oh yeah. It uses it uses what you would think of as like advanced hydro engineering principles and filtration and recycling and uh, if yeah. you can sort of explain how it works so people can get some grasp. But this is not just you know digging little rivets in the ground, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's an interesting thing that happens. It's because there's always this big question of scale, and you know how could indigenous communities, how have they really um, changed vast scales or how do these technologies work at scale? Because we're always in the present looking at the scale of the cities that we have and then saying, well, what is the comparison here between the huge scale of cities and the density of cities, cities and these, the communities that you're looking at um, and have, have been talking about in low tech. So this particular system is almost, you know, the scale of the island of Borneo. It's definitely in the mountainous area and it's a, you know, more than a thousand year old system. And the whole mountains have been terraformed at the scale of incredibly huge watersheds to basically yeah. take in vast amounts of water that are coming down the mountain from the volcanoes, bringing with them all these amazing minerals and nutrients from the volcanic soil on these mountain peaks. And so to take advantage of all these incredible minerals there are these huge terraced environments which take in water that are timed by the release of water from, from um, their, their water temples. So they're controlled actually by priests which open up and allow water to travel into these large scale systems. And so if you look along a mountainside, there'll be multiple watersheds going from the top of the mountains all the way down to the lower mountains that are all sharing water as they come in through the monsoon rains. And so it's taking advantage of these natural conditions. They don't need any fertilizer because of this. They don't need any additions for the nutrients. And then another way, you know, it, it, this sort of system used to be called the, the rice bowl of Southeast Asia because it was so incredibly productive, but it's also incredibly biodiverse. So there's all these different biodiverse relationships that happen from bringing in ducks to the water buffalo that works in these systems, to the insects, to the fish, to everything that actually is created within this one system that provides rice for the indigenous, um, the, the subak farmers. And 
The system also helps prevent flooding. It also sequesters carbon. It um, has these sort of multiple ecosystem relationships, but one really incredible innovation was that when they flood, um, when the, the, the season of pests come in, they flood all the watershed at these huge watersheds at the same time across huge vast scales. So there's no food for the pests to eat. So it becomes a natural pesticide as well. Mm. So they've figured out all these really incredible symbiotic techniques that, you know, what we use for fertilizer and for pesticides, there's no need for any of the incorporation of any of these industrial processes in any of these systems. Right. I mean, or or for another another fun one, the uh, the if you could talk about the forest islands in Brazil, and oh how, yeah, how, how did they make these things? I mean, what are they for, and how did they make them? I'm, I mean, it's really interesting because you did it in your introduction. You did mention the use of of fire of burning, but you're referencing the burning of fossil fuels, right? Right. Um, the introduction of fire and the use of fire or pyrotechnology is actually something that's super common when you're talking about nature-based cultures and, and, and indigenous technology. So you're talking about the Kayapo people who live in the Amazon and they have an area that is the size of Kentucky. It's the largest contiguous area of area that's been preserved in the Amazon basin. And so they have these islands called the Apete. And what they are, are they're islands within the rainforest that they use really slow, really cool fires. They burn these fires into the landscape, into the forest to clear ground. And then they create an agricultural village. And so we call this forest farming. And you see forest farming at really huge scales all across the world. There's lots of different communities that employ agroforestry. And so... The primary sort of um, initiator for these islands is the use of pyrotechnology, is the use of burning. And the burning actually, um, it makes the soil really, really healthy. It, it introduces charcoal and ash into the soil. And then there's a layering system of plants that are based upon different canopy heights. And all these, all these plants are actually food or medicinal or for timber or building resources. So within that, particular forest there might be 2,000 species the Kayapo are actually introducing another 900 species and they're planting these forests in different areas so they have their village gardens they have their medicinal gardens they have their war gardens which they they grow gardens in the time of um, scarcity when there's war or when there's issues with that might compromise the, the food security in their primary garden so they've got all these and they're all spaced out into different areas and then they'll have these gardens working for a period of time and then they'll rest them and they'll create new ones and then the life cycle of the apete after they leave and and that particular garden takes on its own life and and so there's these footprints of these apete forest gardens all the way through the amazon in and the territory like the only way that and, and it's like the only way that a, a Westerner could really understand it or relate to it is go, oh, well, so you have a drug store over there and you put a bunch of stuff in stock in the storeroom. So you have it in an emergency. You've got an arsenal over here with your gunpowder and your guns and you lock it and guard it. And then maybe you get a grocery store over there and a big freezer section to keep stuff. And it's like, it's like the, it, it, it has that function, but in the opposite way. It's more, yeah. it's like these living, uh, uh, these living storehouses, but they're not storage. They're, they're, it's almost like we have this, uh, uh, we, we, we understand everything in the West, like it's got to get it on a hard drive somewhere, you know, and store yeah. it. We, they're understanding everything's in RAM. Everything's a living, yeah. a, a part of a living available system. Yeah, the extractive as opposed to the, like the regenerative or, or the reciprocal. Right, because you think if it's if it has to generate in real time, it's almost like we don't have faith it'll be there. I mean, yeah. I keep getting reminded of of like the Bible when it's like God keeps saying, "Look, I'm going to rain down manna on you. Don't worry." And the people that hoard the manna, it like turns to crap. It turns to worms or something, and they don't get more the next day. And 
And there's this <laughs> sense that nature tries to reassure us. It's okay. We're going to, the plants are going to keep coming out of the ground. The, the more you try to lock it down, the worse it's going to be, <laughs> the less of yeah, us, I'm the less rigid. <laughs> That's the really big difference is that there's incredible amounts of complexity. And like you spoke about in your introduction, the sophistication of the systems is because they're incredibly adaptive because they respond really naturally to environments, climatic extremes, to weather conditions, to changes in soil, to changes in things like pH. And so they're immediately responsive because they're all living in symbiosis and combination with one another. And that's something that we've kind of, removed i mean we removed it within manufacturing and industrial processes that's that's you know in a whole different category so not i mean this is like if we're talking about climate change and climate mitigation and strategies to to deal with climate crisis and environmental extremes which are active which are constantly you know coming in and moving out and shifting and changing these systems work always based on those types of conditions and that's the really opposite extreme that we don't really we don't really have the facilities nor do we build those types of adaptive predictive understandings into the way that we explore economics or or built environments or computer technologies right right and part of it's a, it's a lack of of trust in things that are uh, changing, you know, like I, I, the, the, the example, I'm almost hesitate to bring it up because I don't want people to want to go travel there and ruin it. But, um, there's the example of that living root bridge in India, yeah. I guess. And it's the opposite of what we would think of as a bridge that we're going to go across. It's that the, the, the people there helped, they trained the roots to tie themselves into these beautiful, footbridges, these, these complicated things. And, and I was looking, you know, you described the process with charts, these kind of tubes that they made to, to encourage roots to grow in certain directions and wrap around and tie. I mean, a modern bridge builder would be so anxious looking at, wait a minute, you're depending on life to do this for you? It's like, wait a minute, yeah. the way you build a bridge is you get rid of all the life and stick some steel girders in the ground and lock it down. Um, yeah. That, that, so you look at a project like that, that living, that living root bridge, and what I think, again, as a Westerner, is like, all right, how does someone become an indigenous engineer? Do they have specialists? Are there certain people there who just think up how we're going to make this thing? Or is it a, a, a general slow process? Is it more, more instinctual? You know, it's like we, we, in the West, you want to think, oh, you know, you look at you look at indigenous people building a root bridge that's beyond the technological capacity of anybody in the West to be able to do that and the patients. And we want to think, well, it's kind of like a beehive or the way a, a beaver would make a dam that it's some like these people have some natural instinct to be like that with nature. And maybe there's some instinct, you know, there's some intuition in it, but there's there's actual engineering and trial and error and and there's knowledge that goes in there. So, yeah. so yeah. I guess I'm curious as to what's the cultural, uh, the, 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 the cultural preconditions to innovate on this level? I mean, I would say, you know, there's two different, we're talking about two different types of technologies if you wanna talk about a comparison. So one technology, which we're talking about steel girders and, and, and the creation of a bridge in a contemporary context in the West, we know that you know those come from a lot of money from from uh extractive industries from an uh, unlimited resources from unlimited amounts of energy to create the material then to like put the material together and to and to create that complete system and that's kind of the technology that we're used to technologies that have infinite opportunities the technology when you're looking at a technology that is like the living bridge, that's a technology that's in a situation where bridges that are made, the most available material would be wood, but bridges that are made of wood rot within a couple of seasons. So you need to create 
a living bridge because it won't rot because it's alive. And so out of necessity, out of scarcity for any other types of solutions, this was evolved and invented. It actually came from Lao. Initially, it's thought, and it was migrated by the Lao people who moved up into this region about a thousand years ago and brought this type of technology. So you also see that these technologies are born of specific environments. So this is an area of the world that has some of the highest rainfall. So they have incredible conditions for growth uh, and they have incredible conditions for rot as well, wood mm. rot. And you can still get steel, um, you can still create a steel bridge in that environment. In fact, there is, but it's really hard to get to that environment. It's, I've been there, it's 8,000 stairs to walk down to get down into the villages. It's 8,000 uh -huh. stairs to get back up. It's really hard to get material into that space. So that's another condition that makes it really difficult. And so the, you've got these different types of constraints. So usually you find that these technologies are actually born out of these extreme conditions or constraints. And that's why they have inbuilt this sustainability and these take advantage of different types of mechanisms and understandings of their environments. Um, and yeah, it's funny so I when you say it, it it's completely different. I mean, it reminds me of, uh, it's a terrible example maybe, but it reminds me of um, uh, theater that, that, when I would do theater in a big budget theater, when you have a, a giant stage and all the tech and everything you need, it's really hard to innovate. But when you're stuck yeah. in a basement with like pillars and no lights and this, it's like, huh, how am I going to do a Macbeth in this? And you yeah. end up with yeah. the very most innovative, interesting kind of bottom up solutions uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah, I mean, and, kinda, but also... To your point, like there are experts as well within different communities who are you in the Kanat system, you'll get the expert person who is digging the, the Kanat, which is the underground aqueduct, which you find in the Middle East. In the Subak system, which is in Bali, you'll get this person who is the expert. Not only do what you see on the surface of the terraces, there's also the whole island is honeycombed with water channels to convey water from the top of the mountains down to these Subak watersheds. So there are expert diggers as well. There are different sort of different roles and engineers that are experts that have learned over time that are con continually innovating. It's not just a, a static process. It's really dynamic as well. And not to speak to as an expert on all different uh, technologies or speak for any of the cultures and communities about their expertise. But you know, for example, the bridge, there's a there's a guy that I speak to pretty regularly who has a foundation called there called the Living Bridge Foundation Morningstar. And he's, you know, a young Kasi and he is really trying to um, forward and and teach and and protect this culture of building the living bridges and they're innovating that type of technology they're using bamboo as well as betel nut and so it's really alive and it's constantly changing but it is an incredible expertise as well right so it's a because community this, you know kind of but it's specific too i mean because there's a kind of a prevailing view of indigenous people that well maybe there's a shaman that they stick out there and a couple of warriors but everybody else basically has the same general knowledge and when you look yeah. at, at feats like they've accomplished like oh no there's specialists there's people who've dedicated their lives to understanding how to do this and then they pass it on to someone else over a period of 30 or 40 years you know yeah and and there's specific roles there's multiple different types of roles and you know it's really interesting often you know these roles are passed between generations as well and there's you know, for example, in the East Calcutta wetlands, this incredible sewage wastewater treatment system on the fringes of Calcutta, you can't just join this community. It's four gen fourth generation fishermen who actually control and clean the waters of the city of Calcutta through these incredible 300 fish ponds that they've established for growing food. Um, primarily it's for food, but it's also cleaning all the water that's coming out of the city. I mean, something you keep coming back to in, in, in the book and that's sort of you know dear to my heart is the the way that that survival of the fittest is yeah. is is really is such a false notion. I mean, and you talk about the survival of the most symbiotic, which to me is yeah. the, the team players are the ones that win. Um, do do you feel like the 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 cultures that you were with did they understand this basic this principle of evolution? Um. 
I'm not sure. I've never directly asked the question, so I don't. I don't know if I can speak for for anybody. But you know, the the idea of survival of the most symbiotic that's an idea that was written about by Lynn Margulis in like nine, late 1980s. Mm -hmm. And she talks about this, you know, this transitioning to really understanding symbiosis. I do know that a lot of the technologies, when you look at them um, within, with, with this idea that it is about cooperation between human and non-human species. So for example, the Kayapo, the Kayapo um, live with bees. And so bees are actually kept in houses. Bees are kept beside houses. It's thought that there are, there's a relationship between bees and, and other insects that assist the Kayapa with gardening, these apete gardens. There's also in a lot of the, it's, it's, not, it's seen and it's actually documented in the book that during festivals, mothers and children or the mothers will paint the children and paint themselves in the markings of insects and bees. And that's to, to sort of, there's a discussion about, you know, there, there's a relationship that the Kayapa recognize between themselves and between bees and this idea of being incredibly social and cooperative. So not to, not to speak for anybody when I haven't had the conversation, but I think if you were um, you know, to look at that idea that basing relationships and an understanding of socialization upon a relationship of, of bees and the relationship that bees have coordination. Um, I think that you can, you can say that, yes, there, there is an understanding that there's coordination and, and survival based upon symbiotic relation and cooperative relationships. And, and, and it's very different to the way that we think, which is, you know, get first, you know, you know, th there's a different ideology based upon sort of economic drivers, primarily economic and power drivers for the individual than the collective. That is sort of the dominant right. Western idea. Yeah, well, how do you know you own the forest if you haven't clear cut it, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it's sort of, <laughs> so the, 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 it's funny, it's the, the, it's, I, I often find myself want, wanting to figure out who to blame. You know, and and in your book, you do talk some about the the intellectuals of the European Enlightenment as being, you know, perhaps. Uh, I mean, it was Francis Bacon. I always quote him. It was Francis Bacon who said that uh, it, empirical science would allow us to take nature by the forelock, hold her down, and submit her to our will. You know, and it's like, okay, there's the Enlightenment understanding of science and technology, right? This yeah. this treatment of nature as something to to be overcome. I mean, yeah. we're, have, have you kind of put your finger on where or when Western society, where did we go wrong? When did we, how did we get like this? I mean, very specifically in the way that I look at the, uh, the work of the built environment, I say that, you know, there was a moment in time when we talk about the Enlightenment and you talk about the Middle Ages, it, it's, it could be subjective as to what you want to look at and what area you're focusing on but there is a time when people said okay this is technology this is this is the way we're going to consider technology and move it forward and it was primarily you know written written language in Europe uh, white men who were you know had levels of power and education and, and government in a in a western sense that were saying this is the way we're going to think about technology and this is the way we're going to lead ourselves into a different uh, you know, reality and a different future. And, you know, there are many reasons why that happened. There was colonialism, there was, you know, there was empires, there was different ways of thinking about progress, there was, you know, displacement, there was a lot of stuff going on. But there's also a, a, a very specific idea about technology and development and progress. And, and so that is something that we still have, and that's a legacy that we still bear. And so I think that that period of time, and I'm not the only person by a long shot who's ever talked about this, but that's the period of time where we can see the marking of the Anthropocene as well, which mm -hmm. is the idea that we can actually physically, if we were going to do a bore sample down into the ground and say, we can specifically identify moments where we can see the impact of human beings on the scale of the entire earth. That's when we can start to sort of see those and for the erasure of environments, that we, that's when we can start to see those moments occurring. And what I think happened as well, which you know led us to this point in time is 
there was a consideration of, you know, hundreds, potentially thousands of Indigenous technologies or local technologies that were just never considered. They had never been made aware, were, 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 not, were not really the dominant mode of thinking. And they were just, just they were, they were just not considered and have been since then um, intentionally displaced, erased and removed as we've seen also the displacement and, and erasure of indigenous culture around the world. So these things are all really closely tied into one another. And then, you know, you get to the, the, the place we're at now. And, you know, I was sort of using cybernetics as a, as a, a metaphor for the way that people are becoming aware that, oh my gosh, you know, there's, uh, we're killing the planet. We're all going to die, you know. And of course, some of them, the solution is to double down and build a rocket ship and <laughs> get off the thing. Yeah. But even, yeah. even the well-meaning solutions feel tech bro solutionist to me. Totally. And they're, they're very top, top down. Like, let's throw iron filings in the ocean. Let's shoot sulfur in the, in the, yeah. into space. You know, how, yeah. how do we solve... We, we don't solve top-down problems with top-down solutions, right? It's yeah, yeah. A whole other yeah, thing I, has to happen. Yeah, and I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not sort of the person, I, I taught high-tech systems in the built environment. I've, I've researched mm. low-tech systems in the built environment, these local technologies, which is the meaning behind low-tech. And, and, you know, there, it's not to disregard and say, we're not going to need all of these solutions. We're not that, but it, but completely disregarding, erasing, removing, and destroying a vast oper a, a vast number of technologies that that are in operation that uh, assist biodiversity that actually maintain about eighty percent of the biodiversity that exists on Earth. If we continue on this cycle, like that's just madness. And and by not recognizing that one while we're trying to move towards you know environmentalism and protection of the earth and climate based solutions to not recognize that climate based technologies that are allowing communities to live within their environments really symbiotically but while increasing biodiversity while also fishing while also developing while also having economics and all the other systems that lead to a healthy society, that, that those systems can also lead to a healthy environment, that that's possible. And so there's a huge mindset uh, and a shift to say like, well, what are, how, do we, how do we think about these things? And, 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 you know, I talk about this idea in the book that we're really obsessed with biodiversity extinction and that, you know, we're in the sixth mass grade extinction and the loss of biodiversity is phenomenal and an unprecedented rate, which we don't even know. But we don't talk about the loss of technology and, and the loss of, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, 21st century, its greatest loss won't be biodiversity as we all talk about. It's going to be also technologies and the technologies and the cultures protect the biodiversities. And so the tech, where, while we're sort of obsessed with these high tech solutions, like, you know, shooting clouds up to the up to the atmosphere to stop um, global warming we're never going to shoot a big enough cloud that's going to you know reverse a global oscillation like el nino or to bring seasonal rain sooner or these really vast systems it's just not going to happen and so to think about all these systems that are already in place and all these technologies that already exist that are threatened, that are unrecognized, that are being erased, to think about how they could be catalyzed and scaled up and by assisting communities and by and by you know really championing this these ideas, that's going to be an incredible way to globally think about mitigation of climate change. Right. But I mean, as you say, this is a quote from the book, we're now at a crossroads where we can either continue a narrow view of technology informed by our distance from nature, or we can acknowledge that this is just one way and not the only way for humans to live. Designers yeah. today understand the urgency of reducing humanity's negative environmental impact, yet perpetuate the same mythology that relies on exploiting nature. I mean, yeah. I guess that's part of why you're teaching, right? That's why you're yeah. why you're at university. It's to, yeah. to drop in this other this other approach 
I mean, does yeah. it, does it, yeah. obviously it must influence your, your own design work and philosophy as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the work that I do is very much championed that by this idea of using biodiversity as a building block and by you know if we're doing a uh, a project that's looking at a competition in you know china and shenzhen we're looking at what is you know what is the the past landscape and the systems that have been removed in the last 40 years why aren't those systems that help flood prevention that increase biodiversity that allow for different agricultural um, communities like different types of urban farmings or urban aquacultures why don't we think of embedding those into our cities like why why do we continue with this idea of erasure and this idea of hard scapes and hard technologies and high technologies like that doesn't really you know encompass this idea that 95 percent of you know, the global population really can't afford the technologies that a lot of us are, are in the design community are actually talking about most of the time. I mean, another argument that you make, which is one I find myself having to make a lot when I'm, I'm here arguing for team human, a lot of environmentalists say, why are you arguing for team human? Humans are, are the problem, not the solution. Just get rid of them. You know, and you talk yeah. about the, no. the conservation movement that looks at, it's like, yeah. let's conserve this piece of wilderness and just keep all humans out of it, which is almost the same mindset as let's keep nature out of the city. Let's not let anything grow yeah. on this piece of cement. Oh, no, let's not let any humans in that rainforest. That there's a, yeah. that the, the solution set is, is somehow humans are not intrinsically pollution or destructive. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the conservation movement um, has and it still is and it's happening still today in in you know if you there's an incredible uh, organization survival international if you follow them on on twitter there's constant and continuous talk about what is happening in terms of conservation and the removal and displacement of indigenous and local peoples from their lands and it happens under the guise of conservation and it's not you know not all conservation efforts it's some conservation ef efforts but in the history of conservation, there is a legacy of removal of indigenous people from their territories to, to sort of, you know, the, the, the conservation movement was thought of as a recreational movement. It was thought of as a movement to like protect nature and remove people from that landscape, these pristine landscapes. We're in a, we're in a really different I, a place now where you know where where we're saying that these natural environments like the Great Barrier Reef it's protected for its outstanding universal value, but we all know the Great Barrier Reef is incredibly threatened and dying. So what are we actually going to be protecting in the end? And why wouldn't we talk with indigenous leaders and indigenous communities who have been protecting those landscapes who, and who understand the systems and and this is their indigenous territories? Why wouldn't we and and have you know incredibly sophisticated land management techniques? Why wouldn't that be? Uh, why wouldn't that be sort of? Uh, why wouldn't that be something that we're actually exploring as a means to understand how we can better manage landscapes and 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 how we can really sort of start to think about the environmental movement and environmental diet design in a different way. It's a good question. I mean, <laughs> partly because we're stubborn, partly because we're we addicted give up to a power. mythology. Right. Yeah, and power right. And, and we look and at these land. things and money. How do we monopolize the revenue? Yeah. 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 Oops. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> well, if there's a, I mean, that's why it, some of us look forward to an economic crash. It's like if capitalism breaks, then all of these uh, mindsets and, and practices that are that are supporting it or based in in this extractive, accumulative uh, uh, mindset would would, uh, would go with it. Yeah, I know it's time. I was yeah. just thinking that I wanted yeah. to make sure we were a forty five minutes in. It's time to uh, uh, look at some uh, questions and comments from our. Uh, Participants, yeah? Yeah, we, we got in a few questions, and maybe let me read out the first one to you, and that's by uh, Sophie Krier. Um, actually, it looks like she has a lot of questions, three even, but let me start with the first one. I think that's for Julia, and this one is for you. Uh, how has the low tech book been received by the communities themselves, and how do you see, and how do they see the book? In a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of the communities were actually involved in the writing of the book. Uh, the Madan community, the, the, and the, their communities that I had 
worked with in the past. Um, I'm constantly in discussion with the, the people from the Kasi community and the people who make the living bridges. Um, went through pro different process of um, discussions with the Zuni to, to publish that particular book. And as it expands, there is a lot more people that are interested in, and, and email me and talk to me about their different technologies in their communities and wanting to um, for me to write about those different technologies. But I think, you know, there's also a, an opposite discussion of different communities that weren't included in the book. Um, I didn't include any Australian communities in the book because I hadn't really built up the relationships to be able to write about those communities. Um, but in general, the, the communities are very um, excited about the book and it's kind of, you know, I've had permission uh, requests to be able to translate the book into different languages so it can be shared in different countries. So it's been, it's been great, but there's always a very broad spectrum of people who are talking about the work and, and that can be from a criticism to an incredible appreciation of the work. Well, super, thanks. Um, we have one question that will come to us via Zoom. I'm not sure if Technics are ready for that, so we could take a Zoom question. Um, it's by a person still anonymous. Um, sorry, well, oh, it's not via well, video, no, so <laughs> no. Um, let me move on to the next question that I have here on my tablet, and that's uh, by Ima de Vries from Utrecht. And he's yeah. asking, how would a symbiotic relationship between nature and culture look like in the architecture of today's large urban environments? I mean, we see, YouTube, yeah, <laughs> we see in some cases what these types of um, relationships might be. So in, for example, in Calcutta, you see the sewage wastewater treatment aquaculture system, which is in, located in the periphery of a city of 50 million people. Um, and so you're talking about what specific infrastructures would suit what different cities. Then this idea of symbiosis, it can translate to a lot of different forms. There are, in Europe, a lot of people who are exploring symbiotic relationships of industrial and manufacturing processes. Um, and that is another way that you can see that symbiosis could translate into city functioning um, of different forms. So how would you site perhaps like a brewery next to a bakery so that the bakery so there's a relationship between inputs and outputs of different industrial and manufacturing processes that are happening in a city so i think that there's people who are exploring these ideas about symbiosis in a city um, already that you can refer to yeah and a lot of times these um, symbiotic relationships in urban environments tend to work best if you begin economically rather than uh uh, uh, you know, trying to do it through, uh, trying to teach them about biology or nature or something else. So they, they, they learn about sharing and they learn about regeneration through circular economic methods. And yeah. then that opens their mind to, oh, we could treat this resource like a commons too. And then we can start thinking about where we're sourcing our materials from. And it kind of trickles out, out from, from the abstract to the, to the uh, uh, physical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, listening to, to what you told in your conversation, I also had to think of um, well, this old story about why public transport in the United States ne really never became a good alternative, uh, cheap and affordable, uh, because of the car industry. Uh, can, can you give examples why uh, when these indigenous uh, technologies were kind of pushed away uh, by competitors that simply had bigger forces of money behind them, um, other examples like that? I mean, a perfect example you find in India with the stepwell systems. And so those systems provided surface water and captured surface water to provide water to the cities. Um, they also drained the cities and had a huge, you know, uh, large scale hydrological function within the cities and then colonialism came and so did underground piping and erased the use of all these step wells and all these surface water indigenous local hydrological infrastructures. So 
that's one of those examples. Mm -hmm. Next question I have here is by uh, Friso Wiersen, and he wants to know how can we learn from radical indigenism on how to include future citizens and non-humans in our decision making for the future of the planet? So be a more social and less technological approach to, to your research. Yeah, I mean, I think the concept of radical indigenism is really talking about how can the, the concepts and the ideas that are coming from indigenous communities be thought of to benefit the communities and 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 to be to be used for in a way that the communities are wanting those uh, technologies to be used and I think that it's the idea of looking back into indigenous philosophies and this is not an idea from me this is an idea from a professor Eva Marie Garut who coined the term she talks about this investigation of philosophies and knowledge to come up with new knowledge and so very specifically I looked at that and talk, talk about it in the context of design so in a different context and I say well in design what are we looking at and and how can we think of you know technologies in the built environment differently so for example in the East Calcutta wetlands, in the system that is incredibly biodiverse and incredible for the city, it's been threatened by development. And it's been threatened because people want to put houses on it and the government wants to tax those house owners. But it actually provides a great service to the city. So by talking about this infrastructure, saying it's the largest, most sophisticated natural storage wastewater treatment system you know there's multiple ways that you're starting to think about what are what is the what are the needs of the community there um, how can we start to think about the needs of that community being better facilitated how can we talk to the government about saying this community needs to be um, you know paid for the services the free services they provide to the city and we need to not think of this as land that can be developed for parcelization and for new housing. This is an incredible technology. It's it's incredibly needed and it's a technology that's incredibly unique that could unique that could be replicated in a lot of the different cities around the world. Thanks, thanks. My last question is uh, actually for both of you. We've got about five minutes uh, left in this broadcast. Um, so it's from uh, actually one of our curators, Lara Stolberg, who curated uh, the talks program. Um, and the question that she has for both of you is, um, Julianne Douglas, could you both give one insight from your most recent books, maybe just a simple action, easy to implement, that we could start doing tomorrow to make change? I'm very curious, do you have some ideas on this. Maybe Douglas, you start. Uh, the, the easiest thing is, um, and it's hard under pandemic conditions, but is try to uh, recalibrate your nervous system first by just making contact with another person in your life and holding it and breathing with somebody. You know, it's it sounds silly and new age and a little ritualistic, but if you could spend even two or three minutes just being with another person, your whole nervous system will recalibrate. You begin to experience yourself as safe rather than under threat. And when you're safe rather than under threat, then you don't need to block out everything. You don't need to control everything. You can start to let things in and experience yourself as a more permeable membrane. So for me, the, the, the starting place is always uh, to calibrate your nervous system by feeling safe and open to another person. Let the mirror neurons flash in your brain and the oxytocin go through your bloodstream so that you can experience yourself as a positive part of nature. And then the way you experience everything in successively larger circles will be um, less, less threatening and more of an invitation. Thanks, Douglas, for this. Uh, Julia, what is your response? I mean, my work is definitely a much more about a larger scale built environment, 
but when you're talking about the action of the individual, you know, I think the thing is to be vocal about the type of future that you want to exist within and the, the future that you want your children to exist within and your children's children to exist within. And, and right now we're in the middle of voting for the next president of the United States and you have to demand the type of future that you want to recognize. And so I think really thinking about the, what you support, what you buy, being educated and, and really trying to understand and lift the veil from all the systems and the ideas and, and understandings that we're fed and be critical in trying to understand and operate in a way that you're in control of the creation of, of the future that you want to see for, for you and for your children and beyond. I love that because it's really, it's standing up, you know, it, it's standing up in, a, in an upright way and uh, uh, accepting that you will be noticed if you do that. You know, that, that there, there's, there's a little bit of risk in standing up and saying, this is what, this is the future I want. I'm going to articulate it and I'm going to work toward it. Um, and that's, yeah. you know, the, 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 book, the, the book that you wrote. I mean, I just want to thank you first for being on Team Human and second for your work, you know, and giving voice to people who are, um, boy, they're doing something in a way that's not like the kind of architects that we know in the West who will yeah. publicize what they're doing. These are people who are just doing it in, in the most sacred uh, and, and circular ways that, that I've ever seen. And, and for you to give voice um, and create images uh, uh, to, to tell their story is really a, a gift to us all. Yeah, thank you. And, it, and it's really about sort of saying that we need to recognize other voices. And there are so many other voices that can be recognized and we need to begin that acknowledgement. Thanks, thanks a lot, Julia and Douglas, for being at this opening night of the Impact Festival 2020. Um, I would like also take, to take this opportunity to not just thank you, Julia, for being with us, and, and Douglas, of course, and, and really, Douglas, I'm looking forward to seeing tomorrow's program with um, Sonia Shah. I would also like to thank all the technicians here of Offert House and our own team that have been uh, pushing buttons, trying to keep the connections and keep us live on the air. Um, so thanks again, uh, Douglas, thanks, uh, Julia. Um, there's a few slides that we'll preview to tomorrow's program. And after this, we'll continue with Impact TV for the rest of the night. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.